Welcome to the Philip Wiley Show. Take a look behind the curtain of professional hacking and hear compelling discussions with guests from diverse backgrounds who share a common curiosity and passion for challenges and their job. And now, here's your host, offensive security professional, educator, mentor, and author, Philip Wiley. Hello and welcome to another episode. Today, I've got Ira Winkler joining me. Uh, Ira and I were connected in the cybersecurity security community for, for years, but we didn't meet until the first time at Texas Cyber Summit back in 2021. And actually now we're working together. He recruited me over to Cy where he's working at. Uh, it's been, been interesting getting to work more closely with Ira, but one of the things I really love about Ira is the way he's brutally honest about stuff. He doesn't fluff. He's got some of the most interesting titles for talks of anyone I've seen, just like the titles of his books, like you, you can stop stupid. So that's a pretty interesting title. And, and some of the other titles you come up with talks are pretty interesting. So it's an honor to finally have you on the, on the show. It's an interesting thing about your background is you see so many people in the industry, you know, 30 years ago, it was kind of difficult to be in security unless you worked for the government. Because even when I got into my first IT job before I moved into security in the late nineties, it was even hard to find security jobs. So it's, Mm -hmm. Not often that you get to talk with someone that's got, you know, 30 plus years of industry experience. Yeah. Oh, no, I appreciate that. I mean, honestly, you know, at the end of the day, it's kind of weird you describe it that way. I mean, I would say I was in the intelligence, like, you know, obviously starting at NSA, I could say I was in the intelligence field. And there's the assumption that working at, at NSA, you'd have to know cybersecurity. And theoretically, I guess... You know, when you're at NSA, you're kind of like organizing red teaming, for lack of a better term, because you're there trying to compromise intelligence systems, trying to compromise communication systems and so on. But really, I just looked at it like, well, you know, as a computer person, God, we hated the InfoSec group because the InfoSec group at NSA really did boring stuff. I mean, you know, they wrote the orange book, the red book, the purple book, all those books and everything that that most people in your audience probably never heard of, but essentially set standards for cybersecurity, which is not cybersecurity, it was just regular information or computer security. And so did that, but really it was just being a computer person. Every so often something might involve, you know, well, I guess one job was cryptanalysis that I was doing. I was programming supercomputers. I guess I could legitimately say my first computer was a Cray. And that means nothing at the moment to most people, which is sad. But I was, you know, programming cryptanalytic routines to try to break machine grade encryption, which theoretically you could say that's cybersecurity. But I just looked at it. Well, I was just programming. And, you know, then I moved on to other roles. It wasn't really until I left the government that I was doing real information security work um, because I was actually got a, I, they asked me while I was with a government contractor, could I make a few phone calls? And it turned out that what they wanted was a social engineering attack against a large investment bank. So anyway, I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. And three days later, I had control over one of the world's largest investment banks, essentially just calling up, asking for passwords. I asked for more than passwords. I got them to send me a, a, you know, a computer that had their VPN software already hooked in. That was a, that was a little excitement of a, you know, that was a little bit harder than just getting a password, but I did that. Then I was, you know, my company was still doing commercial information security work. And I was one of the lead investigators on the Citibank hack, which, you know, we ended up arresting Vladimir Levin, a Russian hacker back in, God, I'm dating myself, 1994, and you know, started really loving it. And then my first real job, because what happened was when I broke into, you know, took over the bank, I wrote a paper on how to take over a bank and presented it at the USNIC Security Conference, which I had no idea at the time, but was the premier cyber, sec well, information security event, and you know. I just thought it was a conference in a city I've never been to before. So I just applied to get there. And what happened was it was called the seminal work in social engineering. I had to look up what seminal meant. I had to look up what social engineering meant. And all of a sudden I was a world renowned computer security expert and it worked 
that way. Then eventually I went to the National Computer Security Association where I ran the antivirus and firewall product certifications, wrote a few books, started a company, mostly worked you know, penetration tests, trusted advisor, espionage simulations, sold my company to HP, where I was chief security strategist for a while, left HP when it was no longer fun, then ended up going to, you know, I ended up starting another company, Secure Momentum, on the human aspects of cybersecurity, because I was always doing human aspects of cybersecurity. I mean, frankly, to me, hacking computers was the easy part. It was hacking people, which was, and I don't want to say hacking people, was harder because it's not, but it's harder to secure things right with people and putting the right environment. So anyway, did that. So that company ended up going to be in a CISO for a company, ended up chief security architect at Walmart. Then I am now here at Sci as the CISO. I think I've spoke long enough and I'll take a drink <laughs> of my diet Mountain Dew and let you ask a question. <laughs> I don't know what <laughs> so, so yeah, you, you, eight books along the way. Okay. Yeah, I was going to ask you how many books you wrote. So that I, uh, some interesting titles like the one you, you can fix stupid. I'm sure in some cases some people would argue with that, but but uh, interesting titles along with some of the interesting uh, titles you've come up with for your your talks as well. Well, I actually think I'm actually proudest of the title of all my books of You Can Stop Stupid because you know there was a you know famous hacker said you can't patch stupid. I'm like I thought about that. I'm like, that's actually your job. You know, our job is to stop stupid. Our job is to patch stupid. And everybody's like, it doesn't say you have to stop stupid from existing. It's just that you have to put resilience in place to stop Dr. Evil stupid <laughs> from causing you harm. Because, you know, I, I use the example, and this is a true story, where they were giving out stickers at an event that said, don't click on shit. And this guy in front of me it was the lunch buffet, and the guy in front of me was like, I need a whole bunch of these stickers. My users keep clicking on all the shit there is. I'm like, wow, you must give your users a lot of shit to click on. He's like, what? <laughs> I'm like, well, where are they getting all the shit from? If, you, you know, it's on your systems, they're not inventing it themselves, are they? He's like, oh, no. I go, and if you know you're going to give them all the shit to click on and they're still going to click on it, then why aren't you doing anything to stop it since you know they're going to click on it? And so theoretically, it's our job to go ahead, anticipate what's going to happen. You know, yes, you can't rely on the user to always be aware, but for a user to fail, let's face it, your security mall gateway had to fail. All the perimeter devices had to fail. Then for a user to actually cause damage, anti-malware has to fail. Your you know, DLP has to fail. Web content filters have to fail or so on. And you know, it's our job to stop stupid from having an impact. So anyway, you can stop stupid. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's interesting that you, know, you started with, with a pen testing background. That's to find people in the industry, especially that gets to level of CISO. I just don't see that as common, uh, but that did that really seem to help you in your career starting out on the offensive side? Ironically, no. I mean, you know, I told you I was doing, you know, computer stuff for a while. And I frankly was hacking computers before I knew how to hack computers. I tell this story where I was at NSA and I was training this woman how to use the system like a, you know, major system. And I'm like, okay, you have to log on to the, you know, log on to the system. Great. Now you have to log on to the database. Your database ID is going to be your last name, Kirk, K-I-R-K. Your, okay, now you have to enter your password. Oh yeah, by the way, her last name was Kirk. And I go, you have to enter your last name, Kirk, K-I-R-K. Now enter your password, Captain, C-A-P-T-A-I-N. <laughs> and she turns around, looks at me in horror going, how do you know what my password is? I'm like, you got to be kidding. And she's like, no, captain's really my password. Then she stops for a second. Oh, and by the way, my father was in the army. And at one point he was a captain. So there really was a Captain Kirk. I'm like, whatever. <laughs> now, she seems like a blithering idiot, but she was actually an Ivy League graduate. And the problem was, why was she allowed to have a password of captain uh, with a, you know, I mean, captain at all, which is a dictionary word on an internal NSA system that should have theoretically had, you know, password rules in place. And then, 
you know, so anyway, I remember I went back and I was telling you that story, like, because I was doing a whole bunch of, you know, computer, I was doing administration, I was doing all this. Then I remember, you know, logging on to the system, like there was one time where, you know, we were trying to add a printer to the network. And if you're on Unix systems to add a printer to the network, you have to log on to a computer that has access to it as the administrator. And we're trying to log on and we call the help desk. They're like, we need a printer. And they're like, yeah, it'll be three, you know, it'll be a week. And I'm like, a, you know, so then we just did what I thought was an admin trick. We logged on and then we just type in, you know, SU with nothing. And when you type in SU with nothing, then it, you know, at the time, you know, SU with nothing, if there was no admin password on the system, you type in SU and all of a sudden you came up as the super user. So we were coming up as the super user. We added our own printer to the network and the admins never filed, you know, called back to say, why didn't we complain that they never showed up to add the printer to the network? And then there's other types of things where, for example, you know, I remember I was watching um, some hacking shows like, you know, early hacking and they have like this guy with gloves on typing on a computer screen because <laughs> it's like a 1990 show or something like that. And he's like, now would well, this hacker is going to use a super advanced hacking technique, you know, to determine what what data there is on the computer. And he types in show mount name a system. I'm like, show mount, that's Unix. <laughs> Now, using another advanced hacking technique, the hacker will go ahead and be able to take over the system. And then he just says mount external system as D colon or whatever it was. And I'm like, that's not hacking. That's just bad administration. <laughs> and when you look at what most hacking is, you know, like what's, you know, the statistics vary, but, you know, like something like 80 and depending on the system, it's like 97% of, of hacks should be preventable. And most of it is bad configurations like improperly mounted, you know, improperly protected file shares, no users set on there. So when you ask, oh, all this stuff is an offensive person, it's like I wasn't doing offensive security in my opinion. When I started hacking, I was just Take, taking advantage of bad administration, bad cyber or bad computer practices as a whole. So I think, and frankly, the time not being a cyber or computer cyber security. So I hate saying cyber security when I talk way back when, you, as you know, mm -hmm. it wasn't called cyber security. It was called like computer security or information security. And you know, there was no such thing like most cyber security or most hacking was just taking advantage of things we shouldn't have been allowed to do that. They the admins just didn't know better. Yeah, and it's interesting, too, when you mention some of that stuff, a lot of times people always think during these breaches that all these hackers are elite hackers. And sometimes it's just a matter of they were just poking around, got lucky and got in. It didn't take a lot of skill, but sometimes the public seems to think, you know, it's all, all of it's complicated and, and mentioning some of the configuration things like you mentioned or opportunities where someone is just curious, could poke around and gain access to some files. Well, I remember I was, um, I was one time doing an investigation of a break-in and when there's one break-in, there's probably a dozen others you find along the way. And we were watching like, I, and we were watching, like we'd find a whole bunch of different break-ins and I remember watching one guy, he logged into a, well, dating myself again, a VAX VMS system. <laughs> and he was on a VMS system, which was an electronic funds transfer system. And I was watching because we had keystroke monitors there. And I was watching the guy type in Unix commands on a VMS system. And you're like sitting there like, how stupid is this person? He was able to get a foothold couldn't even figure out the type of operating system he had. <laughs> and I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm like trying to, and in my head, I'm like yelling onto the screen, try DOS commands because DOS was so much closer to VMS, you know, or what was the deck command language, DCL or whatever. But anyway, what it was like, you know, DOS was so much closer to the VMS command language, whatever it was at the time, than Unix was. And I'm like, if he would have just tried DOS commands, he would have got so much further. 
And so it's just like shocking. Another guy broke into a bank system that I was watching and he just created a wares site on the system. And I'm like, he broke into a system, could theoretically try to steal tens of millions of dollars and he's creating a wares site. And it's not that he didn't steal because he was so honorable. He didn't steal because he didn't even bother looking around to see what he was on. So anyway, that's, um, yeah, I mean, most people are just lucky. You know, it doesn't take, see, the hard part isn't breaking into a bank. The hard part is laundering the money once you steal it. <laughs> that's what most people don't understand. So so one of the things, too, that, you know, we kind of spoke before the the episode you were meant, we were talking about different topics to discuss. And I think one of the ones you brought up is a great topic is like the security shortage, you know, be able to hire mm -hmm. uh, qualified talent and, and that sort of thing. So, so what are your thoughts on, on that subject? Well, I wrote an article a while ago, something to the effect, the myth of the cybersecurity skills shortage. And at the time I was criticizing, you know, the focus on, you know, whether it was like these boot camp certifications or cybersecurity degrees. And I wrote that in 2015 ish. And it's still true today because I go back and I look at my time at NSA, like the people who worked in InfoSec at NSA, they were not these highly skilled, you know, people in theory and in just information security. You know, they just took computer people and, you know, rotated in people would take whatever jobs they felt like applying to. But at the end of the day, we were all computer people. We were computer systems analysts and took one job, one, you know, for a couple years, took another job for another couple years, you know, sometimes the acquisition, sometimes development. I didn't know a lot of people who really focused on the cyber or, you know, the cybersecurity world, as we would call it now, because it really wasn't as, you know, exciting as breaking into foreign intelligence systems. You know, the whole Tau and like NSA's hacking, that really didn't start wholeheartedly until like 2000 when I was out of there. But, you know, and there wasn't that much of a focus. But even when there is, the way you find people is to find good admins, good programmers, good database managers, and just train them in, I don't want to say the intricacies because it makes it sound really fancy, just enhance their skills on certain aspects of that are security related. Because I think you said you start out as an admin. Being an admin compared to being a security admin is really just a couple of extra commands here and there. Uh -huh. You know, being a database manager compared to being a database security person, it's a couple of extra commands here and there. On the other hand, if your claim to fame is you got a BS in cybersecurity, and you have no experience, and now you're in charge of trying to do software security for a major system, you're going to be completely lost. You're not qualified to tell programmers with 20 years of programming experience how to secure their software. I'd rather take one of those programmers, you know, five, 20, five to 20 years of experience, say, hey, let me give you a little bit of enhanced training. Let me give you a little bit of mentorship in secure software development. And now you're a secure software security expert. You know, it's a lot easier to take all these people who are already potentially in your organization and train them in the specifics of security than to try to find some little, you know, certification fairy and go, bing, you are now a cybersecurity expert, you know? Anyway, but for some reason, you know, the people who teach these boot camps and uh, and everybody else in this industry has somehow convinced people otherwise. Yeah, some of those boot camps and stuff and some of those trainings, you just have to kind of watch for. I saw, saw something over social media over the weekend. Some guy was running some Discord server and doing some training, selling courses. Uh, <laughs> pretty expensive, I understand. But one of the things he was putting down was the the community college that San Francisco city college. And that's where Sam bone uh, teaches. And Sam does workshops at like DEF CON and black hat and stuff. And these other security conferences really knows his stuff, but you take someone that really didn't know what they're doing and they're putting this person down. I guess if you're not that good, you'd want to try to <laughs> scare people away from your competition, but uh, that's, well, you know, 
Well, let me be clear. I have no idea the individual quality of these. Um, you know, I have no idea the individual quality of a of an individual training course. I don't really care. My issue is I'd love to see people who have experience in the computer field to be cross trained in perhaps one of these boot camps or one of these courses or whatever. And it, that's different than somebody going to a boot camp without experience and then saying, okay, now you're trained. Now you're the co company cybersecurity expert. There's a difference in that. So, you know, I like the quality of boot camp. And the thing is, I really hate people who want to put down community colleges. Community colleges are pretty, are doing a lot of good work. I don't like, see, I have this like other thing where like, I don't think of people really appreciate the value of a college degree. I mean, if you don't have one, that's fine. But the problem is people say, you know, I hear all these, sorry, Dr. Evil quotes, influencers who are trying to convince people, you don't need a degree. You don't need experience. You just have to think cybersecurity is cool as long as you spell it K3W1, you know? Um, I mean, because that's really the problem is that you don't understand what a, a, a degree program should be because every so often, like we go in a pendulum. It's like, no, you don't need a degree. Oh, we need soft skills. What does a college teach? Like 75% of a bachelor's degree are soft skills. You know, it's skills unrelated to, you know, your major, assuming your major cybersecurity. And okay, so where are you going to get that? You know, college is supposed to teach you how to think. It's not supposed to be a trade school. And too many people are teach, are trying to treat a college degree as some sort of trade program, which it's not. And if they're selling you that, they're wrong. Even though I know a lot of, you know, colleges are trying to sell you, oh, come to our college, we'll give you three certifications, or you'll learn certifications by default. Not necessarily anything wrong with that, as long as they keep it to the theory. Because just for example, and you know, a little bit of a tangent, but it's kind of related. Just for example, machine learning is going to start to take away people's jobs. And ironically, mostly the lower level jobs. So for example, SOC analysts and things like that, how's machine learning going to do that? It's going to be able to more efficiently start looking at incoming alerts and automating the processing of alerts, doing things and so on. It's going to take away the need for a lot of people with some very, very basic skills. However, what machine learning actually is, and a lot of people don't understand, it's really just mathematical formulas. It's more advanced statistics than we've been able to conceive in the past. You know, it's just you have to understand and in order to like understand machine learning, you have to really understand some mathematical principles. You have to understand I will tell you, I took a course in machine learning for my doctoral degree. And the problem is that I got an A minus in the class. I got a patent filed out of the class. Actually, it might be two to three patents at the end of the day once they go through. But I understand about 10% of what I learned. And it was still, I was in that class, like trying to understand like, okay, what are all those mathematical symbols mean again? But you have to be able to understand that to program, to understand the attributes that go into a model. You know, what are things that tweak it and everything? And again, you don't have to know this for a lot of basic positions, but if you're going to be around a longer time, if you're going to learn how to interact with statisticians, with business people, with computer engineers and other people, you're really going to have to learn a little bit more than just what you get from a basic certification that's more of a trade school than anything else. So anyway, I think I went way off topic there and probably had a few people hating me now, but um, <laughs> hopefully they appreciate the sentiment of what I'm going for, even if I didn't express it that well. well I think it's good that you're sharing your experience and the truth because some sometimes people sugarcoat things and make it look better than what it is and get people's expectations up. It's like you're telling someone you don't have to have any experience at all, no degrees, no certs, and you can get a, just get a job. You know, you're just really 
misleading a lot of people and they're going to be frustrated, you know, trying to find jobs with like zero experience or credentials. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it's not just that it's sort of like what's harmful to this is like, so another one, Oh, you don't have to know how to program to do cybersecurity. It's like, for many jobs, no, you don't. The reality, though, is it's really helpful to know how to do some basic programming anyway. It's really, you know, just for example, when I did awareness, it's helpful to be able to know how to do macro programming and spreadsheets. If you're going to have a spreadsheet based program, you need to know how to like essentially, you know, there's lots of data, lots of sorting. So it's really helpful to understand that. And that's just supposedly a very non-technical aspect of cybersecurity. But at the end of the day, I care more that you're willfully ignorant, that you don't learn something. I mean, I know people who work in finance that downloaded Python to teach themselves how to program because they thought knowing how to program will make them a more effective finance person. You know, and cybersecurity, yeah, you don't have to know how to program for many jobs, but it helps you. How are you going to tell people like a database, you know, database manager how to secure their systems if you don't understand their management programs? How are you going to, you know, tell people how to secure their software if you've never developed or you don't even know the basics of software? But more important, going back to the point you're making, a lot of people don't understand that, you no, know, a job might have no requirements whatsoever. Say we want to start somebody new. The problem is that if you put a cybersecurity position in, you're likely going to be going ahead and competing against people who know how to program, who have college degrees, who set up their home labs and have a lot of experience of self-teaching themselves actual skills, which is much more than how to post 17 messages a day. You know, like I see more of these influencers trying to get people to like, here's how you can post to multi multiple social media platforms simultaneously they teach them that as opposed to here's how you do fundamental password condition setting or something, whatever you might call it. And, you know, you're going to be compete, even if it doesn't say you need this stuff, you're competing against people who do. And you're doing yourself a disservice by not teaching yourself the basics. Good points there. So we're getting down towards the end of the show. Is there anything you'd like to share before we close out your episode? Um, well, I should do some self promotion. Sure. Uh, you know, again, I, I mentioned you can stop stupid. That's a good book. I also wrote security awareness for dummies. If you're into that, I don't really get money for this anymore, but spies among us, if you get a used copy is a good one. And then, um, I guess those are pretty advanced persistent security that actually I might get money for every so often, but you know, that's a good book. Um, you know, at the same time, say hi, if you see me, you know, stop by the, you know, go to CYSEC, C Y E S E C dot com. I really hate how they say it, it should be C Y E. Anyway, yeah. anyway, go to CYSEC dot <laughs> com and look at what we do if you're into risk optimization and the like, and I'll leave it there. Sure. Unless, you have any other, unless you were expecting me to make some other point. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what uh, talks have you got coming up, conferences that you're speaking at coming up? So as far as I can remember, I think I'm speaking at a private CDM event September 7th. I'm going to be in InfoSec World in, um, in Orlando. Then I'm going to be at a Neptune Media event in Hawaii in October. ISSA LA, 4th and 5th, I'll be at ISSA LA, Los Angeles. Then I think I'm next one, ISSA Raleigh Durham chapter, always has a large, great event there in Raleigh Durham. ISC Squared event, Black Hat Middle East, I'm going to be giving a keynote, I think, there. I'm doing something there. I don't know what it is. <laughs> and then um, another event in LA, and probably a few others will be added in the near future. Very busy schedule. And sometimes I think I'm busy. And then I look at your speaking schedule. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's a quality. I'll give you a little. I grew up in an apartment in Brooklyn, New York with bars on the window. You know, I thought I want to get out and see the world. And then I got jobs at NSA and I was thinking, oh, I'm going to travel the world with NSA. I ended up pretty much stuck behind a computer in just about every job I had there. 
And, you know, all I can say is I'm at the point where I would definitely rather be on an airplane for eight plus hours than sit in front of a computer terminal for eight plus hours. Well, appreciate you taking time to, to join me today. It was an honor to have you on my podcast. It's an honor for me. Anyway, <laughs> thank you. Thanks, everyone, and we'll see you on the next episode. Thank you for listening to The Philip Wiley Show. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. In the meantime, to learn more about Philip, go to thehackermaker.com and connect with him on LinkedIn and Twitter at Philip Wiley. Until next time.